So dear people, Chin Chin, here I am. I have my, <laughs> I have my cat cup, right? I'm trying to sell my own mugs, of course, but I love the cat mug. I actually really would like to have a cat or a dog, but yes, that's another discussion. Anyways, today is going to be question and answer video. I got a lot of questions and I'm really happy about it. Since I'm kind of the chaotic person, I'm sorry to say that sometimes I didn't have the name anymore of the person <clears throat> who asked, on, on, especially if, it, if the person has been asking on Instagram. I'm sorry because the stories are deleted after one day and then they're gone forever so i'm going to switch between the names of the people and also somebody said right because i don't remember anymore who asked um so let's start with the first question the first question is from tony hey tony how are you and your name i remember and she asked i can't memorize scale tones and names of chord progressions visualizing that's my favorite english word visualizing patterns works visualizing pattern works so she can visualize pattern that works sorry for my english any tips so first of all that's a very good question and i just lately realized how many of my students struggle with exactly that topic and i also can relate <laughs> because i had to true story pick up the ukulele some years ago because i actually don't like the ukulele i'm sorry um i had to pick it up to get a teaching job at a private school so i learned like three chords and started teaching you know <laughs> that's how you do it and then i yes i got a lot of students also in, in another school where i'm teaching with the ukulele so it's sort of a fallback plan of on for me you know because you always have to have a lot of different income streams as a musician so it's good if there are no people applying for guitar then still the people who want to play ukulele can come and yes so i started teaching ukulele maybe three years ago and then after a while i started to have like sort of a ukulele ensemble so with like with notes noti notated music and reading music and sounds really cute actually three ukuleles at the same time but i had to read notes so music notation and my students uh, grown-ups they are pra practicing actually they're the one the, the kind that is practicing <laughs> and i'm the kind that is not practicing the ukulele and the ukulele is gcea so the strings are like right like the four strings on the guitar, like the E string on the guitar is the A. So everything is like a fourth higher. And since I'm not practicing, I have to fake my way through my own lessons. <laughs> and I um, just, f I'm, I'm looking for one note. I count for that one note if I can remember the name of the string. And then I play by ears. And then I can't visualize like any notes on the fretboard or anything and just like hear what my finger are playing and I know then that that's right but I don't know the name of the notes in the moment I play them and yes also with the chords there's a lot of confusion and yes so I think what happens after a while is that you really know all the notes by heart so that's what is happening to me with the guitar I don't have to think about it anymore and I realized that that's really like such a big leap to know what you're playing and some people probably will never do that because it's really like maybe another way of playing the guitar in the beginning because we can play the guitar so much. I just made that video about those cycle of fifth where I'm losing the form because I'm shifting chords along without thinking but I just know if I'm going on playing it in the same pattern it's going to be a cycle of fifths but then unfortunately the fretboard <laughs> ends and then I have to start thinking again and I also remember <laughs> this is going to be a very long video when I had my first lesson with my guitar teacher he just like gave me the Chopaz book right that I made so many videos about the Chopaz book 
And he was like, yeah, let's play the chords. And he played the chords and he, he discovered the stuff and he analyzed the chords and he was like totally enthusiastic. And I was like very happy if I could like play one chord after 10 minutes. So I, I understood his enthusiasm, not really, but somehow, I don't know, that's how teaching works. But yes, you guess what I'm going to say now, right? So I think the thing you have to do, dear Tony, is to start knowing what you're doing at some part of the fretboard, right? So it can be reading music notation. They're very good books from Berkeley. I can list them below. And you can start by reading music in one position. So maybe let's say fret one to five and really stick for that for a while. Or the other thing that I did a lot and what really helped me, I had a, a very good friend of mine. She played saxophone and we have been playing duos for like ever. And we have been, we both bought the fifth real edition real book, Can't Talk. And we then just like played through the through those tunes because I'm always curious if I have notation I always want to know how it sounds and so we just played you know like afternoon in Paris autumn in Paris or <laughs> uh, autumn leaves or whatever we just like played through that book and and I accompanied, accompanied her right and so I had to see a chord symbol and then know a chord so i it's like the difference between active and passive right so sort if we're playing without knowing what we're doing it's sort of passive i guess passive learning you know but if then there's the question like this is the chord symbol what can you play then you have to actively think about a chord that you can play and i can only one thing that really helps is like to not get caught up in too many difficult chord shapes, but maybe just really like start with the shell voicings. And if you don't have a duo partner, you could also like really sit down and say the name out loud of the chords. I know that sounds really stupid, but I do that too, because in that way I'm making sure that I'm really knowing what I'm doing. And then, you know, just start with the name of the chords not the structure right not what is it just start anywhere but maybe with the name of the chord that means you know the name of the root and the character is it major minor seven or dominant and then yes it's it's just like a a, a voyage you're starting yes and i think 10 minutes per, per day will be enough or maybe 10 minutes three times a week or maybe 10 minutes <laughs> once a week, right? But you have to actively go and do this exercise because the guitar is built in a way that you actually don't have to do it, right? We can play like this. But I think if you keep on trying to do that, it will come and be patient. I'm still struggling with ukulele. <laughs> Okay, next question is from Jan Willem Kapel Veen. He is from the Netherlands and he's a long time follower. Hey Jan Willem. And yes, he's asking, can you tell tell something up your, about your time in Amsterdam? And yes, I'm, I made some no notes, so that's why I'm looking always to the right side. Yes, so I don't know what exactly you want to hear, of course, but I thought I'm just telling some general stuff that I remember. <laughs> so I've been studying at the Conservatorium von Amsterdam. Van Amsterdam. My, my Dutch is not heel goed. I speak a bit in Netherlands. <laughs> but they, now they have a big building next to the central station. But when I studied, this building didn't exist. And there were like two buildings. One is, I think, like an ancient, not ancient, like a former post office don't remember the name of the street but it's close to the Vondel Park and the other building was the Siemens house Siemens house near to the central station and I was very very lucky I had an apartment 
in not an not an apartment. I had a room in a in German we say WG, you know, like more people are living together in one apartment. I had a room in the Prinzenracht, which is amazing. I had like 10 square feet, very, very small room, but I had it for the entirety of my studies, like five years, close to five years. A lot of my students, they all had to move sometimes every month, every six months, every year, because they didn't get a, an apartment for a longer time. That was a really big problem when we started, because we have been the first generation that started studying in Amsterdam. Before that was in Hilversum. And yes, I remember that I had that small apartment. I remember that I had a, a bike with two locks. I still have a bike with two locks because if you don't lock your bike with two locks, that's how it used to be around 2000 at least, your bike's going to be gone <laughs> the next day. So, and I also learned that you can buy uh, bikes illegally on the street very easily. It's fits to cope, so you just need to know the the bridge, the bridge where you go to and then you just like all of a sudden somebody comes up with an old bike and feeds the cope and then you can have like a bike for like 50 gulden at the time there was no euro I also had my first smartphone from Ben which is really was, was really like a huge smartphone with an antenna Ik Ben I was so proud about that smartphone <laughs> And yes, I remember the school was very international. I have been living close to Lights Plain and there is a jazz club where I could go and listen to jazz. Listen to Jesse van Roller, Martijn van, uh, van der Grinten and many players and that was really great. There were sessions at, the, at, at oh, I don't remember the name of the place. There was a cafe where Wednesday they would have a session and you could go everywhere and play. And Amsterdam at night is really beautiful with all the lights and the and the bridges. And I used to cycle from my apartment to the Seaman's house. I could rent a room. I would have a lot of privacy for practicing. And one thing that I also remember is the library. It was really cool to have so much music at our hands because at the time Spotify didn't exist. So we all sat in the library and copied music on cassettes and that, that recorder. And yes, I have very fond memories. Also, I have to say at the time I was in a rela relationship that wasn't so nice. And that was maybe one of my lessons that I learned at the time, that how important it is to have a partner in your life that is really supportive of what you do. And so at the entire time when I've been living there, I, I was in a relationship that maybe wasn't the best for me and the lesson that I learned from that is that I'm having a relationship now with somebody I love very much and it's very supportive and how important that is so that it's maybe off the topic but it's so connected with this time and I really made like a conscious choice to not come into such a negative relationship anymore but okay I'm digressing let's go to the next question. So somebody asks the best way to play faster guitar and what is the best jazz guitar book to learn to play. So I don't know the best way to play faster guitar. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you mean how you can play faster on the guitar or how you can play fast on the guitar. So if you're wanting to learn faster to play jazz guitar i have to disappoint you you it's a very long road and it takes a lot of time you have to be patient and more look more for the process and the work routine than for the product because if you want to learn it quickly like this just forget about it <laughs> sorry if you want to play faster guitar, I have this book from Troy Stettina, the metal guitarist, which is very good. And I wrote down like three things that I think that are important if you want to get faster. So one thing is to work on your tremolo. So playing really fast notes on one string, trying to reach like 140 beats per minute in 60 notes at least, but 
going for 160 beats per minute. Trying to play legato is the second thing. Many people don't understand why it's so important to play legato, but it's about making sure that the notes are closely connected and that there are no gaps in between. And the only way you can achieve that is if you're playing extremely fast in that split second where you're changing from one note to the next and that split second your synchronization of your both hands has really to be in sync so that the moment you're hitting the string the moment you're playing the next note is the same note is the same moment so basically you're letting the note ring out and then very very fast switch to the next note so it's a very slow exercise but it trains you to play fast i made a video about that as well and another very nice method for getting faster is to practice in like bursts so basically if you're playing a lick you're playing the first two notes in a really high tempo and then you're adding one more note and then you're adding one more note and then you're adding one more note so try that i'm not doing that enough but it's a really good method so another person asked how do you learn a new jazz standard yes so i would think listen to the jazz standard as much as you can and maybe if there's a vocal version of it even learn the lyrics and listen to it and sing along and maybe you can start with a melody that you really can like sing the melody and then try to start to sing the melody and play the chords on the guitar while you're singing the melody if you're more advanced you can try to do a chord melody right with the emphasis on every note of the melody gets a chord and then I would record the chords of the standard on your looper because then you already have to know your chords right and then you play one chorus the melody over the chords and one chorus of improvisation one chorus the melody and one chorus improvisation and then you transpose the whole thing into another key maybe the next day all the chords in another melody in another key play the melody play the chords and give it time give it time maybe two or three months like this then take a break and then come back and do the same thing and i think if you do that one or two times no two or three times this tune's going to be really deep down deeply ingrained in your system right and this the magic trick is you know it's always so difficult because all the people say the same stuff and nobody nobody does it because it's so hard <laughs> but the magic thing is very boring transposing <laughs> if you transpose especially with the guitar you're just going to get it so much deeper into your system just try to do, doing that so Patrick Hespela Pagels. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> he asks, why are we surrounded by so much horrible music? <laughs> so first of all, I totally can relate to this question. I had to think about so many moments where I was surrounded by horrible music. For example, I have been on a vacation with Derek and we have been in St. Peter Ording at the North Sea. I'm, I'm sure you know that place. And there's a very cool new like modern ho hotel at the beach and they have like a like a, you know like a swimming pool and a and, and saunas, a wellness area, really huge wellness areas, and we were really like very happy. And then we went into the sauna. <laughs> And then really the most terrible music, like so completely ruined it for us. And then we went into the restroom and then they had music there as well, like in a tiny speaker with like MP3 quality. And yes, that was really like shitty for us because 
I don't know if it's only for musicians like this, but then you, you can't stop listening, right? And you can't relax. And of course, the thing we seek the most is the silence. <laughs> and yes, I also have been thinking about the fact that uh, maybe that's what you're relating to, <laughs> that there's so much music uploaded or so much music being made and published in these years than never before and I had to google it so at Spotify there's 100,000 songs a day because basically everybody can upload there of course I uploaded some stuff that I just recorded on my computer there as well so nobody keeps you from uploading There are no gatekeepers, right? So that's good, I think, because it's democratic, right? Everybody can upload. <laughs> um, but yes, of course, there might be more garbage. I also googled that there's the variety of tone quality and pitch has been decreasing, decreasing since 1955. And that the music has been more homogenized. So if you're listening to the radio, of course, you exactly know what I mean. It sounds like it's only one chord progression left. <laughs> Don't know which one it is. But that's, of course, super boring. But I have to say, first of all, I have a daughter. <laughs> she's getting to be six. And she's. I want her to listen to whatever she wants to listen. And so, so she's listening to Paw Patrol. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you have children, but I'm listening to a lot of music I would never been listening to. So I sort of desensitized a little bit. <laughs> and yeah, I think in our age when we, we are so overwhelmed with information, but also with music, it's The only thing that I can say to you, I'm sure you know that, but I'm also anyways going to talk about it, is that we really curate our own media intake, so to speak, whatever it is, be it the podcast, be it the YouTube, be it, be it the news, very important as well, or be it the music that we really make like a conscious decision what we listen to and I can't agree that we have only terrible music in general because I think there's a lot of great new music out there you just have to find it of course and I also if you want to can list some of the podcasts I'm listening to that very often talk about artists I not I don't know and I, I discover a lot of new music in that way and I don't think that there's more terrible music than ever. I think there's more music in general and that there's not probably the same amount of great music as before, but maybe just it's harder to find. And yeah, I think we all really have to take care about our musical soul and nourish it. Don't give up. <laughs> there's always new music to be found, to be found. Okay, the next question is in Germany. In German, it's from Batches Bader. I, I, hey, Batches, we have been communicating. I don't even know if I pronounce your name right. I'm going to talk in English. I hope that's okay. So, yes, one question is, why have you, why have you become a guitar teacher? Very good question indeed. So, so, okay, just going to be honest. In the first place, I have become a guitar teacher because I wanted to earn some money, like everybody else did or does. So I started when I was 16 or 17. I have been playing for one year and then I already started giving lessons. But I also have to say I enjoy teaching depending on the situation, right? If I have a full day of like six students at the age of six, <laughs> that are all beginning guitar players and I'm teaching from the same book. It's a sure way to completely drive myself insane. So I have been striving my entire life to make the situations in my life that I have to have, so sort of to accept what I'm having to do. So teaching will always be a part of my life. But then I'm also striving to make that as pleasant as possible. And in my case, that means teaching students who 
already can play and also who want to learn jazz and I'm happy or lucky to live in a city like Berlin where that is possible because here the city is very diverse and people come from everywhere and I can have like private students that are only interested in jazz right so it's like really like a small group and I'm sure if I would be living in a smaller town I could like absolutely forget to do that and that's also one of the reasons why I'm living in Berlin because <clears throat> always thinking about moving to a quiet village of course but yes it's um it's nice to have people grown-ups that come to your house and I'm learning a lot of stuff by myself they bring recordings or talk about YouTube videos and we have really like I don't want to say a friendship, but it's really like nice. <clears throat> and I'm looking forward to teach to teach people who really want to learn something. Um, and also the other thing that I wrote down is, so of course I'm getting also recognition from teaching, right? That can be tricky, right? Because I'm the teacher, so I'm God. I'm like God. I know everything and. I know that some teachers really like thrive on that and I don't want to thrive on that. I don't want to feel great because somebody else can't play. It's not the way I want to teach. And also because I know in relationship to other musicians, I'm like maybe a, a very good, maybe a, a good guitar player, right? But I'm not like anywhere like a genius or something. And the other thing that is very important to me that I realize now that I'm getting older is that the structure, right? Because we freelancers, it's a crazy life, right? So we get gigs, we don't get any gigs, we have a pandemic and we have a month where we might have so much work that we don't know how we will ever survive it or ever get to the end of the month. And then maybe we have three months of nothing. <laughs> And so teaching gives me the inner stability to have a day, like Tuesday is my local music school day, where I'm teaching from like two to eight, right? And I also have to go somewhere, which is great because most of the time in the meanwhile, I'm working in my apartment and that can be really tricky. So I joined a fitness club. <laughs> I'm doing some weightlifting. I can only recommend that because I have already feeling that my, my neck and back is getting much better, but I need to have a, a reason to leave the house and teaching gives me a reason. I'm going somewhere, I have a room, I'm feeling like part of society <laughs> because often I don't feel like part of society as a musician. <laughs> and yes, that's another reason why I like to teach. Okay, so the other question is from Budges, did you ever have a student that has been eating a döner before your lesson. And now I don't know the word in English, so it's going to put it here, a döner. Yeah, so I, I'm sure I had <laughs> students smelling. I can tell you, last year it was super hot here in Berlin. <laughs> like really 39 degrees, or I don't know, really ridiculously hot. And I had a student who didn't shower and he was, he was smelling. So I have a rather small room where I teach like maybe 10 square meters. And he came in and I thought, <laughs> I'm going to vomit. And younger, younger guy. And I just really didn't know what I should do because I, I always, you know how it is, right? I can't, if I... If I tell him, please leave immediately, then I could get in trouble with the school. I'm not sure, right? And because the school where I work, I only get the lessons that I'm giving are, are being paid. If I'm not giving the lesson, you know, there's no like Urlaub, there's no vacation being paid, there's no Renten or Sozialversicherung. That's only the lesson that I'm giving. So this is always like a inner dialogue if what I'm going to do because I don't know if anybody's going to back me up. But after 20 minutes, I just said to him, I'm sorry. I don't know what I exactly said, but I, I, I told him that he had to leave. <laughs> 
And he, he was pissed off. He was really pissed off because I just forgot to shower. It's not my fault. And I have to say, at the public school where I'm teaching, it can, it can be quite cheap to have some lessons there with me. I, I'm having one free place if you're interested. Not you, budgets, <laughs> But anybody who wants to save some money. I have one free place Tuesdays. Um, a lot of people come there that don't have so much money. You can also have like, I don't know, pay close to nothing. And I don't know what it is because it's like, Oh, what is it in English? You know, it's like a service, like a public service I'm doing. I have sometimes the feeling the people accept, expect me to keep up with so much bullshit, right? So in the years I have had to let go of a lot of students and that's always very difficult. But talking about teaching, last thing is really like, I, I won't accept a student like this anymore or somebody who's really like draining me of the energy because I think you also wrote you had one student and you had to lay down and had a headache and I, I can completely relate. I had a student who went through my stuff which never happened in so many years so I have like a cupboard and I went to the to toilet and my, I totally trust all my students and I ca came back and she was had been opening the cabinets of the of the cupboard and was going to through my stuff I couldn't believe it and she said oh I'm just looking for blah 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 and she had no business at all looking at my stuff and so this trespassing right I have I had those moments and situations of trespassing I also had like some older guys who or one older man who really always started like a political discussion started shouting and I needed like four or five lessons until I finally said to him I don't want to have this discussion anymore and then I also managed to get rid of him which is really hard because you can't cancel so easily on those students but I'm not taking students like this anymore because they're ru ruining, ruining my entire day and that's not the point of my of what I'm doing right I want to have a positive energy when somebody comes in and have a lesson and of course if a person like this comes in and then the next one comes in I'm not in a good mood and I get like resentful resentful for the next person and this next person has nothing to do with that situation so I'm trying to really avoid to teach people who, who have a negative energy a very negative energy okay oh another question from Butchers that's very good I can't really translate it but a little bit did you ever think why certain students pick certain instruments like you have that example from somebody or oh, I can't translate it but you know like that it doesn't make any sense what they're like picking for an instrument and you have I have to say, I haven't been thinking about that so much since I don't own a music school. I, I think you have a music school, right? So you have all the different instruments, but I only have the guitar and the ukulele. <laughs> but I understand that you are obsessing about that question. Because there's one question that I'm obsessing also over, and that's that many wom women don't play electric guitar also have parents who are not don't want their girls to play electric guitar you know they always start with acoustic guitar and then the parents are like oh no no they don't try to say it like I don't want to play that she plays the electric guitar but they just like put a stop to it they don't encourage it and also have a lot of grown-up women who start with the ukulele and yes there's nothing wrong with the ukulele but for me the ukulele is something sometimes like a an instrument not like a real instrument I know that sounds really stupid but like really it's something where you can hide behind right because it's very small and you don't get any so much attention and 
Yes, that's what I'm wondering about. Why not in generally, but often why women wouldn't pick the electric guitar and why they wouldn't play jazz? That's a question I I don't understand. And um, I have some women and girls that play jazz guitar, but really a few, often very young women come to me and they just have been playing for like six months and they want to start, but that I have like a student that has already been playing for a longer time, already has been improvising and then comes to me that I have that a lot with men, but I never have that with women. And I really don't understand it up to a certain point. I think that society maybe doesn't encourage women enough. And I can also say that's a really tough life. <laughs> Being a mother and a jazz guitar player, but yeah, being a father and a jazz guitar player is tough too, I guess. So that's what I'm obsessing about. So next question is from Magate, Magate Diagne. Hey, please forgive me. I'm sure I'm buttering your name. It's Magate Diagne. And he says, my question is the one a lot of Fred Mets don't often ask what are the main elements to use to play jazz bebop and this question is such a big question how can you play bebop and it's actually not the first time I got it that somebody asked me that so I'm going to make a video about that please be patient and please be sure if you have some specific questions write them down in the same post I just want to say, if you want to get started with bebop playing, I would suggest that you get started with playing bebop heads, right? So like Donnelly, Confirmation, or maybe Now is the Time. Um, and that you learn to play those ornithology themes on the guitar as a first step, because bebop lines, they are really... The guitar is practically not built for playing so those lines. But if you start with playing a melody and then transpose it, you're already going to be on a very good way to hear it, especially the transposing part. So next questions, a bunch of questions from Lawrence. Hey, Lawrence, hope it's getting good. And he asked like a lot of questions, like 10 questions. And I thought I'm going to answer <laughs> them all because they're re like really good questions so question number one how do you start an improvisation what are you doing when there's no idea in your head but it's on you to start your solo and then I had to think about a workshop I have been attaining with Antonio Sanchez so we have the last chess music store in Germany I guess in in Berlin right uh, because I guess Thoman destroyed everybody else <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you have been there it's like a really big building and on the fourth floor they have like sometimes like concerts and workshops I haven't been there since the pandemic but it's really cool to go there and so Antonio Sanchez talked a lot about improvisation there and he's also been playing solo drum concerts and he has also been like improvising for 20 minutes and he's been talking about a concept that I want to share which is really great and that basically works like this at the start of your solo you play something anything it doesn't matter it's not supposed to be premeditated right you're not thinking about it you just it's your turn play anything <laughs> then you have a break and then you play the same thing again and then you start to like develop a story from that thing that you played in the beginning and he really demonstrated that in such a cool way like with the drums it was a little bit more uh easier to understand maybe not so abstract right so he like started with like something on the snare and developed something there for quite a while and then after a while he sort of developed a new idea on another like symbol you know like with the same concept introducing a new idea and then sort of having a dialogue between those two 
And what he managed to do, which is like the most astonishing feat for me, is like at the end of his solo, that's what he's trying to do, is he played that same thing that he started his solo with. So like after 20, 20 minutes, so maybe he's always playing the same thing. I don't know that, but I know. So I can very much relate to this question because <laughs> it sounds a little stupid, but the better you get, right? You sort of have all the options and then you know everything more or less what you can play and then you can just like think uh, am I going to play this or am I going to play that and then but sometimes it feels like so meaning meaningless I find if we are not connected to it and I also think if we think about a thing that we might use to start our solo in a concert in that given situation it just like in my opinion will never fit right because it's this moment and to be in the moment that concept's really great because then something is going to come out right that has been influenced by the room that you're in by the people you're playing with and Our subconscious is so mighty and especially very fast, much faster than the thinking process. It might come up with something really cool, right? Better than if we think about it. So that would be my tip. And question number two, is jazz only improvised music? Yes, so it's getting a little bit rhetorical here. <laughs> Not so fond of discussing categories, I guess. So, but I would say that jazz is improvised music, but I would say that not all improvised music is jazz. <laughs> and also I want to discuss for a moment that word jazz because I really don't like it so much. And I found this really, really cool video from a street, street photo, photo, photographer, from a street photographer. I will link that video below. And there he's talking about the category of being a street photographer. So what does it mean? Yeah, it means you're taking pictures in the street, of course, and that he's teaching also, and that he has like discussion, discussions with his students what street photography is, right? And what is supposed to be happening it, in it or not. And he just said, and I, I, I really like that idea so much, that this discussion sort of useless right doesn't lead anywhere so maybe two people discuss what jazz is and then one wins <laughs> great <laughs> so what right it doesn't make us better musicians and yes i'm just like trying to really get away from categories right so now question number three is so if jazz is only improvised music If so, is improvisation what Keith Jarrett thinks it is? Or is improvisation what Jamie Abersole thinks it is? So yes, this is again probably a question that I wouldn't think about so much because I don't know how it would help me with my own music making other than What of course came, comes to my mind is Keith Jarrett, right? He's like improvising in a way with his trio that is super, super com communicative. So like, you know, if he like, I, I, one of his hairs going from the left side to the right side, the whole band reacts like this, right? So it's about reaction, interaction. And of course, that's what jazz music is about. And of course, Jamie Abersole, that's a pre-recorded jam track that won't never react to the way that you're playing. So I'm thinking, is, so is that bad improvisation or is it not improvisation? And um, I think it's not important if it's a bad or a good improvisation. I think it's good that it's an improvisation at all and that there's no right and wrong, right? Everybody is allowed to find his or her own way of improvising, right? And I think, you know, the older it, I get, it's so tough to be a jazz musician. And we, 
what interests me much more is how I can keep my motivation and keep staying open-minded and develop an attitude and also a way of seeing things that help me grow and be free and discover new stuff, especially discover new stuff. So question number four, how much does your sound have an impact on your solo Right, A lot. I'm thinking guitar now, of course, because with the guitar you have guitars that have a lot of sustain. You play one note and then it stays for a long time. You have guitars where the note ends very fast. And also what I just learned recently, which is very interesting, is that amps, amplifiers, react in a different speed sort of I'm, I'm probably speaking about like microseconds but the sound how it comes out has a different speed depending on the amp that you're playing and of course if you're so like me I'm often joining a jam session I don't know the amplifier then that can completely fuck me up because I'm expecting another development with a sound but that's all on a subconscious level and yes I never really really realized that until now right how important it is to I, I think it's like if you're playing a gig right and the first set is terrible and the second set is great because everybody's accustomed to the sound all of a sudden that's kind of interesting don't know how that is with a saxophone of course I think with the breathing and everything you can of course control how long uh, a note is much easier than with the guitar but if you're feeling uncomfortable with your sound that can of course have a big impact on the solo but I also think it's impossible to always be satisfied with your own sound and that it's good to find ways to still have fun and then maybe focus on something else. But yes, of course, sound has a huge impact on your solo, right? Question number five. What is the most important skill in chess? Interpre interpretation of a standard tune or anything else? Improvisation, phrasing, <laughs> timing, groove, language, sound. What should one emphasize one most when practicing? So, yes. I had to think about that book, The Inner Game of Tennis, and there's also a book, The Inner Game of Music, which is really a great book, also very inspiring for teaching. And one thing is to practice improvisation um, with restrictions. So I would suggest always only to focus on one thing when you practice, and I'm sure, Lawrence, you know that, right? <laughs> But I would say, like, for example let's say phrasing right so that one would improvise in the rhythm of a given phrase from Charlie Parker or whatever and then only only really focus on this one thing because with my students I very often have that oh my my timing is bad um, and then I've, and then they have so many things at all at once they think they need to focus on a here up here in the mind on all the things at once and that is not possible so I would say generally focus on one thing and then focus on the next thing the next time but regarding to playing I would say don't do that at all but just like don't think <laughs> because that's really the lesson that works for me the best is to let the subconscious do the work right because it, that's the fastest way so the ears and the hands and of course the listening but not the thinking because i think then everybody's always going to be too slow to react to anything like when i'm speaking right i'm not thinking i'm already babbling on <laughs> okay um Six, how do I learn to compose real original music without sounding like something that already exists? Don't know if I'm the right person to ask this question because I'm always struggling big time with composing. I can only talk about how I see the creative process in general. So 
I think about myself like as a filter, right? So, so I think everybody's unique. And I think that's something that's emphasized in jazz, right? So to find your own style, to do your own thing. And that's also something that is rewarded to be recognizable. And the way I think that might work is listening to a lot of music and practicing your instrument for years. <laughs> and then not being afraid that you would... For example, I've been transcribing a lot of Kurt Rosenwinkel. I'm not afraid of sounding like him because I think of myself as a filter and if I'm playing in a way that is not so conscious but with a no thinking process, stuff will come out I can't control. You know, I also had the discussion with one of my boyfriends in the past, another boyfriend, <laughs> Um, and he was always so concerned that he would practice stuff and it wouldn't come out, right? Like practice a phrase or, or a cool 1625 lick or whatever. And he was always like, why doesn't it emerge in my playing in like an you know, organic way or whatever? And I think what I learned in the meanwhile is it doesn't come out in the way we want it to. We can't control it. Or if we control it, it will always sound awkward, I think. But it still informs our entire playing and it does something to our playing style, to our learning process that we can't conceive, but still it changes us and things happen to it that we can't control. And I think it's the same with composition. If we find a way how we can compose without thinking which is hard to do because especially in my case I have so many negative thoughts but okay let's that's another subject but without thinking if we can just like create a way of composing that we can compose without thinking so be it at the piano uh, and with a recording program right like garage band or something where we can just play and play or with a saxophone just like to record phrases maybe every day and then just like have a lab library of ideas and then play, maybe find some chords, but not with a goal of writing any songs. And I discovered this um, Patreon channel from friend, Meneses, she's a graphic designer and she said like, she has this thing which I find so great, it's the graphic ugly sketchbook. She's filming a video from the ugly drawings that she's doing I'm thinking about doing something like this as well like like you know like tunes that nobody wants to hear <laughs> I'm thinking to do something like tunes that nobody wants to hear just to force myself to write more music and then just yes just like accept that nobody wants to hear them or that they're ugly and start from a place like this and let go of everything how everything is supposed to be because I find also if you're talking about like jazz and jazz standards and if we have that in our minds when we compose it can be so limiting and then might might be also sounding not so fresh so I hope I answer this question now next question is it imp more important to play with accuracy or with heart with heart right What is the difference between groove and timing? Groove is when I'm dancing and timing is when I'm getting negative thoughts because I think my timing is bad. Okay, I, I think, yes, right, timing right is like you can play at the center of the beat or laid back or in front, that's timing for me. And groove is much more something that you feel, right? I've been thinking, is there groove without timing? Is there timing without groove? Next question, nowadays, if I want to check out a band or a musician, is it better to listen to one song or album, album over and over again, or is it better to listen to as many different recordings and performances, performances as I can? I would say everybody has to decide it for themselves. I have the tendency to only listen to two or three songs a lot, But also sometimes I like uh, force myself to listen to an entire album. So my, my particular problem is 
that I'm having the feeling that my ears are so full of everything that I can't really listen to anything anymore, so I would rather listen to silence. If somebody's a younger person with fresh ears, I would recommend listening to recordings over and over again, at least for a while. I think we never had that problem when we were younger, right? Because we had to buy the CDs and the LPs and then we would just like listen to them endlessly. And today it's like, what am I going to listen to? And this endless searching. And yes, maybe making playlists and sticking to them. But I don't know if it's better to listen to one song song over and over again or to listen to many different recordings. I think both is, is valid. What can I do to not lose motivation for practicing? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I have to say, which is really uh, difficult for me, is follow your heart. Because I think in jazz, there's really a lot of rules, unspoken rules, right? And do's and don'ts and how it's supposed to be sounding and what you have to listen to and don't you know that record? And if you don't know that record, hoo -yoo -yoo -yoo, that's not good. <laughs> so, but still to, for me, I can say tell you what motivates me. It's to do my own thing and give myself the permission to check out stuff that maybe doesn't fall in that especially realm of jazz. Also what helped me with motivation is to know my th myself. So I have been reading a lot of books, I'm going to link them to, de to below from Robert Greene and he's talking about, um, so I'm going to show you one. So I can't find the book, but it's called Mastery. And it's a lot about how the brain works and understanding how our psyches work and how, men, how people are alike and how people are different. And that's a topic that interests me a lot. And one of the things that he's saying in Mastery is also that we all have like so much potential and that we all can learn so much. And especially if we're getting older, sometimes we tell ourselves, we limit ourselves. And he's always talking a lot about not limiting yourself, right? We can have beliefs ourselves about ourselves, what we can do and can't do. And sure, maybe over the years, some of those might be true, but I think it's important not to let them rule your world, right? So that we can still explore new stuff, you know, like a child, you know, like my daughter, Theresia, if I go to the museum with her, I love to do that. It, it's because I really see how f that fresh look she has and I try to have that as well. But I'm going to list some of the books below. For students, I think motivation comes from... So I see my job as a teacher mainly in keeping track. So I always have making notes what my students have to work on. And I try to come back to those songs again and again so that they have somebody who ha uh, ha holds them accountable. And I think that's a motivation because there's somebody who knows what you have been practicing. And then I ask again, how is it going? And we can work on that. Last question, when is this guy stopping to type stupid questions into the comment section? I don't know, <laughs> but I don't think it's stupid questions. I think it's very, very good questions with a lot of answers to it. Those answers are, of course, only my opinion. So somebody asked, hey, Tina, do you have any tips or advices on time management for practice? I googled actually time management and they have like some tips that I want to talk about. So one of it is place. So I think it's good if you have a place where you practice, where you have everything set up. So if you want to practice, you don't have to set everything up. Your guitar is in tune, you have your tuner, your metronome. And maybe in an ideal world, you have a room where nobody can hear you play and you don't disturb anybody as well. Because for me, that makes such a big difference. And my favorite place is the public music school. I'm cycling there 
and it's like my cloister at the weekends practically nobody is there it's absolutely quiet I have a room with no distractions and I can work in a very productive way. I can never achieve that in my apartment because so many things that distract me. And so a place is good. Try to have a place that's only set up for your practice session. And yes, have a goal. Sit down and think about what you want to achieve and try to maybe have the bigger goals but then break it down into smaller goals and then smaller and smaller and then like be really really detailed so not you know don't write down I'm going to practice improvisation that's going to kill you <laughs> maybe write down which tune you want to learn a song is always a good start and then maybe practice two bars of it or two chords and then be even more specific maybe you want to practice connecting scales maybe you want to practice arpeggios maybe you want to practice chords but practice something very small and then maybe i don't know what your life situation is right so let's say you don't have any time at all <laughs> and your family father or whatever so then let's say 10 minutes and then start with this 10 minutes with this thing that you decided to do and then try to keep on doing that and after a while if that works out maybe go up to 20 minutes yes and one thing that really helps me is to have the same task at the same days of the week so if you're having a partner and you are also always or a family and you let's say you're always practicing every Saturday morning and everybody knows that and it's getting going to become like a routine that will make it so much easier so I can only recommend that you have like certain hours or days of the week and if it's only one day of the week that you practice and everybody else knows that that you're either going to go practicing or that you're going to be in your room and maybe the first two or three times it won't work out the way you want to but after a while it will work out because everybody knows it so in my experience if i'm starting a new routine so like i'm starting to weight lift right i so, you know like just for my back and my shoulders i had i i expect to run in trouble in the beginning right the first time i forgot my towel which is kind of disgusting i still did my workout <laughs> The second time I had a problem with my member card and I couldn't come in, I couldn't lock my locker. And I'm just like thinking, yeah, that's normal because I'm just getting started with a routine and that not to um, like, oh, no, nothing is working out. I, I, it's not supposed to be working, but like, yeah, that's normal. Let's give it some time. And after a while it's a routine. And one important last thing that I always need to remind myself is not to um, what's the word yeah don't try to catch up with stuff right so if you let's say you're practicing every Wednesday morning and Saturday morning you set up for yourself that you're going to practice two times a week 30 minutes and then that week is total chaos which it is for everybody every now and then maybe you're ill your children are ill your guitar is is broken whatever it is so you can't practice for that week that you're just going to practice the next week like not, nothing happened it's Mon uh, it's Wednesday and Saturday morning right you know what I'm saying you're not going oh shit I didn't have those two times last week so I'm going to practice four times next week don't do that just you know think about it jumping off the wagon jumping on the wagon and don't you know I think that's the biggest trick because we all are making plans and then that maybe don't work out and then we give up on them. But just to come back, just to accept that's life and get back on track. So that's it for today. I hope I could help you a little bit with all those questions. I'm thinking about making a question answer video like this every month on my Patreon channel. Let me know if you like that. I'm thinking about making a Zoom meeting actually so that we can see each other because 
I know a lot of people are watching this video and you don't want to be like public and I totally get it but maybe some people would like to do that and I, I would like really like to get to know you all we can meet up in a zoom meeting with the guitars and talk about stuff once a month on my patreon channel that's an idea that I have and yes hope you're doing fine see you around bye